Right. So yeah. Hey everyone. I'm Adam. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you about modern desktop app development. And like, I definitely come from more of a web development background, so I understand that that seems kind of scary. At least, like, you might think that you'd have to learn like a language or tree, or you know, it seems very difficult or at least different. But in reality, I want to show you that as a web developer, not only do you have all the skills that you need already but in fact that the desktop is actually where you can leverage your skills the most. So quickly, just a bit about me. <coughs> so I, I'm the head of Teamwork Chat at Teamwork. We have desktop apps with NWS, moving it to Electron. Um, yes, I'm from Cork, so you're gonna have to get over my ridiculous accent. Uh, I created like Ked a couple of years ago, I did the wrongs, it's a stupid little Joe Corconian scripting language, you might remember. Um, so I maintain a few NWS related open source projects and I recently wrote a book on Electron. There is uh, my GitHub username there where the slides are going to be. So NWJS. So there's a lot of history with desktop apps but I'll just start to say like back in like 2011. There's this guy called Roger Wang. He worked for Intel um, specifically on open source and he created a, a project called Node WebKit. So this was just a combination of between Node and the WebKit rendering engine, so that no, they could you basically use a Node module to create a new window, and you could run Node code within that window. So later on, he, he hired an intern called Sheng Zhou. They both together replaced WebKit with Chromium, long story short, and they realized that this could be a really cool, cool desktop app runtime framework, and it just took off. So long story short, they changed the name from Node WebKit to NWJS, but Basically, if you download an NWS app, since I since I said it's Chromium plus NW N plus Node, um, you download the app you download contains Node, uh, Node, Chromium, and then the actual app code. So this is a little bit big, but like you know, most of people who complain are developers, not really real users. But um, so yeah, so it really took off. Um, so you get to create desktop apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript since it's Chromium, right? So that's really powerful. But how does it work? So um, this is what Chromium looks like, roughly, really simplistic. Um, so if you ever looked at the task manager in Windows, um, you will always notice that there's at least one, or at least two processes for Google Chrome. So there's always a backend kind of main process, and then there's one per tab, and I think they might do one per extension as well, I'm not sure. But um, so yeah, so this is how Chromium works. There's one that handles the main processes where like the JavaScript runtime is, the rendering engine, things like that. Tab send access like the DOM and things like that, whatever. That's where your you know your web page lies, um, and then these processes interact over what's called inter-process communication. There's also um, they they interact then with native APIs. So for example, if you click a mail to link, then it will open a default mail app. So that's just a native API. Things like that. Um, yeah. So this is how NWS is different. So basically, it's pretty much similar, but they just hacked in a way that you can run Node from within each window as well. So not only do you have access to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you've ac also access to all of like Node's built-in modules and any modules you have from NPM, and you can require other scripts and modularize your app like that. Um, and also then you have access to built-in modules and APIs from NWS itself. So there's a little arrow there between the the two windows, because by default with NWS, you start with one window. When, you, when your app starts, it starts with one window, and then from there, in your JavaScript, you can use built-in modules to open up other, mo other windows and do all sorts of stuff. So the, it's really, cr really, really easy to create your first app. This is basically Hello World. Um, you just create a package.json. If you're not aware of what that is, with every Node mod, uh, Node.js module, typically it has, a pack well, it has to have a package.json which contains like the name of the module, the version, and dependencies, and a few other things like that. The first command here is how you create a default one. So, and by default, Node.js modules have JavaScript, has a JavaScript main script, so that's just the entry point for the module when it's required. But in our case, it's gonna be a HTML file. The HTML file is the entry point for NWJS. Um, so basically, once it outputs the example package.json, you just need to change the main property to point to your HTML file. Then once you install the official NWJS package globally, you can just run it with a path to a directory, and then your app opens up. So I know this really doesn't look like much, but it's a big deal because you, you here now can have 
any styling, any structure you want, you just know how to do it, right? You already know your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript. You can load scripts, include style sheets, do anything you want in here. And you also have access to Node, like I said, so you can read and write files to disk, you can do all of those sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, so, no, I can go back. So, the one thing I should have said here as well is like, you, know, you have one window like this by default, and it looks, you know, it says, okay, like let's say it has that native bar, you can remove that native bar if you want. You could have a frameless app, you could have um, like a custom frame, you could have semi transparent windows, you could have fully transparent windows, you can have completely hidden windows, you can do lots of different stuff. Um, so like, I took this further recently, and with NWS, I created Clippy. So like he animates and everything. It's a bit strange because this is on a Mac and same Windows 10. Um, so yeah, so that link there, you can see like how I made him. Um, so yeah, like I, like I kind of mentioned a while ago, was that as well with Node, you get access to all the modules from NPM. So if you don't know what NPM is, it's just a package manager that everybody uses for Node. So and they have like a philosophy of like small single purpose modules. So there's a lot of them out there. And if you if you're thinking about say like how do I do this on my app or whatever, there's already probably a module out there. Most of the time, there's loads of little bits you can build on top of. So it's great. You can just easily like if you're used to Node, it's the same way. You just install them from NPM and then you can require them in your app and you can just use them from anywhere in your JavaScript. So uh, oh and like I should say like no, uh, NPM recently went over like 300,000 modules, so it really shows like how popular that actually is. Peop with other languages, sometimes it's kind of thrown, like it's not really used like CPAN and things like that, but it really is with Node. So, this is Atom, like GitHub, GitHub's text editor. Uh, whether you use it or not, this was like a really big game changer for desktop apps. So, this, this is again HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, believe it or not, you maybe already know. So, what happened was, I think it was in like 2013, um, GitHub decided they wanted to create their own text editor. They hired that intern that I mentioned earlier called Sheng Zhou from uh, Intel. So he came over and was like the maintainer of the project, the one, one of the main contributors at least. Um, so they created Atom and they originally named the, they open sourced the base as Atom Shell, which was a fork of uh, NWJS. It's disputed whether or not it's actually a fork, but whether it's a fork or it's re-implemented from scratch in the exact same way. So like for the end user, it's the exact same usage in API. So yeah, it's a fork. Um, <laughs> so yeah, they l so this really, really took off because they kind of really improved on the formula. And they later renamed Atom Shell to Electron. Um, they're really pushing it, like say, like their docs are amazing and things like that. Um, so yeah, um, so there's a few notable apps that use it. So like Slack, uh, Visual Studio Code, Nihilus there, and the, the big one is the Mail app, that they're really, really pushing it. Um, Hyperterm, Terminal, there's a lot of different stuff. But how is it different? So again, it's very, very similar. Like I said, it just improves on the formula, right? So like, wh wh the only thing that is actually different here, aside from the name, is the fact that there's a Node.js logo in the main process as well. So by default with Electron, you get no windows when you start your app. There's a backend script, so instead of a HTML file being your entry, it's actually a, a script. So when you start your app, it runs a script in the back end, and from there you do everything. You create your windows, you do everything. Um, so from there you create a window, and in there you can then still use Node like NWJS, but from the built-in modules that come with Electron, some of them have to only be used on one side of that boundary, like on either on a renderer or window, or, or else on the main side. Um, so for example, like all window management and automatic update stuff, all that needs to be done in the main process, and the rest needs to be done in the, the window, let's say. Um, so sometimes you'll have to like communicate back and forth over that line. So like, um, let's say if you have a button that when you click on it, it should close the app. So it's gonna like, you know, manage the window, it's gonna do something to the window. You would have to like catch that click in JavaScript, then send a message across basically to the main side, and then catch it and then close the window. So the way you do that is like I said, I mentioned earlier, inter-process communication. Electron has a built-in module called IPC for this, so you can basically like emit any arbitrary events and catch them on the other side, just like event emitter or anything else like that if you're used to Node. Um, yeah, so that's, oh, and I should have said as well like that both NWS and Electron abstract those native APIs with their own, in their own modules and APIs, so like you can easily create a tray icon or open the default app for a mail link and things like that programmatically. So that's really good. Um, 
So the hello world for electron is a little bit more. Uh, so like I said, by default you have, if you, ran, if, if you tried to start your app, nothing would happen because you have to o actually open the windows for the main app, for the main script, I mean. So this is what a, a main script would look like. So basically, requires a few things from Electron. When the ready event is fired, it creates a new browser window and it loads your HTML file. So it's very similar to the NWS one, except that's kind of done under the hood. By default, you have one window, but with this, you have to do it. Um, yeah, so similarly, um, you need a package.json, but since the, this time the HTML file isn't the entry, you need to put, you can just leave the main property pointing at a JavaScript file called, it's usually index.js, so if you just create an index.js, that will be used as your main script. Then once you install the problem, um, module from NPM, uh, then you can just run Electron again, and similarly to NWS, and your app will open. So again, it looks the exact same, right? And it doesn't look like much, but why is it, re wh like what's the big difference between the two, right? So like, yeah, you have to have separate processes, and you can only use certain modules in, on some sites, so there's better organization of your app, but that's not really, like, why are all these, why is it more popular, why is it taking off, and why did I say it improved on the formula? So, one is just is like it's so popular that there's just so many people using it, building great stuff. That it, there's a lot, a lot of tools out there and open source projects and things like that. So, like if you say, for example, uh, let's say you, you want your app to remember the size it was the last time it closed and reopen at that size. That's on npm. You just require it and you just call it like just one method and it's done. Like there's loads and loads of stuff out there like that. There's loads of it. So, because it's so popular as well, it's been used, like it's been used in production as well by GitHub themselves with Atom, and just a lot of people pointing out bugs in it and things like that. And support is really good as well. So, if you create an issue, like it'll be closed or at least commented on within two or three days. Um, they're, I, I actually think they're fantastic. They, um, like in end of dress, for example, I've seen like three year old bugs that were like legitimate bugs and they haven't been fixed. But I, I don't hold it against them because like, you're <laughs> in their case, it's like the NWS is greater with like C++ or Objective-C++ and the people using it are writing JavaScript. You don't have people really contributing it to it. So I'm really grateful for what they've done because it, it started all of this, so it's great. But yeah, support is better with Electron and it's just less buggy as well because it's just like being fixed more often. Um, so as well, like I said, they improved on the API, they improved on the formula, so I mean like the APIs as well and stuff, and they added new ones. So for example, with NWS, there's just stuff that doesn't make sense. So like, there's an API for creating shortcuts, like keyboard shortcuts, so even if your app isn't focused, you can have a keyboard shortcut that might play music or something like that. And uh, if you bind to Control shift a on a Mac, it will bind to Command-Shift-A, and that's intentional and has been pointed out and hasn't been fixed in like two years. Like things like that are really annoying. So Electron, when they forked it, forked it, they uh, just fixed that straight away. And in loads of other cases, just fixed loads of niggly things that doesn't make sense. And they also added new APIs. So like there's a lot more integration into the desktop. Um, there is like automatic updates are built in and stuff, things I'll talk about later. And like I said, their documentation is way better. So like I'll just have an example. They actually went and created an Electron app to show off their APIs. So not only like, so this is one here now to create a window. Not only does it have all the sample code and describe everything, it's an Electron app so you can actually execute it. So like I think that's brilliant, like it's really taking documentation to the next level. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much everything here. So, but like I'm sure there's people, like whenever I talk to people about Electron and stuff, they are saying, it's not really a native app though, like it doesn't feel great. And especially when you think of like cross platform um, mobile frameworks, they're, they're usually terrible. So, but I have to say this does feel good because it is essentially Google Chrome on the desktop with your app inside it. So it feels just like any web app in Chrome. So, so whether or not it feels native, that's a different thing. So like it'll feel like a web app, but Let's say, for example, like it won't look like a web app either. It's up to you to do that, right? So, um, but I would only argue against that because, like, like if you want to make it look really native, because how many apps can you think of nowadays that like look like Windows Explorer or Finder or Mac? There's not many. They all have custom frames and dark styling and all different stuff, you know. So, uh, as well as that, like there are things on the web, like say, 
if you hover over a button, the, the cursor turns to a hand, whereas on, on, a, on a native desktop app, that won't happen and it'll just stay as a default cursor. But is that better? It's up to you. Like, whether you want to make it really feel native and does it hurt the experience or not, it's up to you. Um, if you really want it to look native, there are CSS frameworks coming out, like this one here is Photon, which is, that's all HTML and CSS. So if you really wanted to make it look like an OSX app, um, but yeah, that's up to you whether you would or not. So performance-wise, just like web app and Chrome, you can make a really performant app, you can make a really bad app. Um, yeah, so luckily like you have all the tools, like all the dev tools that from Chrome that you already know to be able to debug it anyway. So even if you do make a bad app, you have all the skills already, or at least if you don't, you learn them, it'll help you with web apps as well to be able to improve say memory, CPU, all different things like that. So I'll just show you that quickly, so. So there you go, so there's your standard dev tools with all normal options, you know. So, sorry, I meant to, oh, clippies in a way. Um, but yeah, basically. <laughs> so, just like a web app, it's up to you. Um, there are some ways that you can make it even perform more performant than a web app. So, like I said, you can create as many windows as you want and stuff like that. You could have a worker window. So this is like a window you create which is hidden. And you use IPC to communicate with it. And you could get have all your expensive processing computation done in that window and then have the result come back over IPC so then it doesn't affect rendering, painting, scrolling, anything like that. Um, but it's really extreme. Like You probably don't have to do it in most cases. Um, also, Node has, like, you know, you can execute system commands, execute other executables. They might be faster sometimes, but, like, I've never had to do it. This is, like, just talking about, like, absolute edge cases if you're really pushing it. Uh, with Node as well, you have, like, the ability to have what's known as native modules. So you can basically write, like, a module that has C++ in it. So if you really needed to, like, interact with a native driver or if you really, really needed performance on one particular thing, then you really could. What we're talking here about, like, something really niche, you know, Mo you will not need to do this. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's say you're, you're going to build an app, you want to share, ship it. Um, the platform support is really kind of wide and deep, so like NWS sports, Windows, Mac, Linux, um, you can port over Chrome packaged apps to it, like it has, it uses, you can still access all the same APIs as that does, um, so Chrome or removing support for Chrome package apps, so that's a way you can shift it over to a desktop app easily and still not change much of the code. Um, Electron st support starts on Windows at Windows 7, uh, whereas NWS was supported as far back as XP. Uh, and Electron even supports ARM, so like you could have like running on, you could run on a Chromebook or on a Raspberry Pi. Um, that's pretty much it. Like you could, that's that just loads. So like so. You probably don't need to, like, you could have 32-bit or 64-bit apps as well. So you could get away with, say, like, just having 64-bit or 32-bit for Windows and OS X, but for Linux, you need both for compatibility. Um, so let's say you are building one, and let's say you pick Electron because it is the trendy one and they fi there's a few little things fixed. Um, Electron Packager is a good open source project. Like I said, there's loads of tools out there already. So this will build your app into a dot .app or a dot .exe. Um, so it's really handy. Um, you can use it programmatically or from the uh, command line. Uh, then Electron Builder uses that module plus other open source ones. So it goes a step further. Um, it's really great. It does loads of things. Like it'll, it'll build that app to that .exe and it'll create Windows installers and it will code sign your app and all different stuff like that. Like code signing is really important because, like, when someone downloads your app and opens it, like OS X or Windows might complain like that you know, we don't trust this, de this developer or something like that, or antivirus could like ha trigger false positive if you try and execute something while your app is running, things like that. Um, the annoying thing about code signing is that, so like if you're just building a normal app, it's fine, you can just work on Windows or whatever, or, Linu or Mac or Linux and build for, for all of them, but if you're code signing, you can only code sign on that platform for that platform. So this is when you're getting a bit more serious about it. So like if you're code signing your app, Basically, you have your version you're going to put out. You then have to grab a Windows machine, build it, sign it, on a Mac, build it, sign it. It's like, you know, it's still one gulp task or whatever, but still you have to do in two machines, which is annoying. <coughs> but Electron Builder was made with, like, automation in mind. So, like, you can run it on, like, continuous integration servers. Um, so you could use, like, AppFair for Windows and 
Uh, you probably need to set up like Jenkins on a, f on a Mac machine in house or something like that. I'm not sure of, I'm not really aware of any uh, CI services like out there. Um, but yeah, but it was made raw automation in mind, so that's a really good thing. So as, you're, as you s keep pushing and pushing it, there's more benefits from it. Like so, so I mentioned automatic updates earlier, right? So um, NWS doesn't have this built in, but since it's Node, you can kind of do whatever you want. So. There are there is an open source module called Node WebKit Updater, which will handle it for you. It'll download a new app, replace your current app, and open it. Um, but it's kind of custom, right? So Electron has it built in, but they don't support Linux. That's just like they just decided. Um, so they really recommend that you go through like package managers for Linux. So um, yeah, you just publish each new version in there. Um, but there is a built-in auto updater module. So it's really, really simple, it's great. So it only has a few methods. So once you instantiate it with a URL pointing to your up update server, um, then all you have to do is you can call a check for updates method. It's event driven, so it'll fire events like update downloaded, update ready, different things like that. So once say like update downloaded is fired, like so when you, when you call check for updates, it will trigger a download of an update if there is an update and it will fire the update downloaded event. In that case, then, if you call the restart and install method, it will then restart your app and actually update and all that. Um, so it's really, really simple. You can hook that into your UI any way you want. You can have a button that's check for updates, then let the user know it doesn't update, then they can click install, or you, know, you probably don't want to interrupt them and force install it. You, know? you can do any way you want. But under the hood, it's, um, it's kind of interesting as well. It's, 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 it's worth knowing about, even though the API is simple. So like. It uses a, a framework called Squirrel, but on Mac and Windows, it's just completely different. So under the hood in Mac, it's simple enough, but like you need a server. So when you give it a URL, it needs to point to an actual server. And basically, when you click check for updates, it will send a request to your server asking for updates, and your server, like with the current version as well. And your server basically just has to return a 204 if there is no update, and a 200 if there is an update, with JSON with a URL pointing to a zip file, and then it will handle the rest and will download it. So that's basically it, right? So um, with Squirrel Windows, um, it's pretty different. Like under the hood, there's a bit more code, or at least a bit more magic. So when you click check for updates, like, sorry, you don't need to have a server. First of all, it could be static files anywhere, on S3 anywhere. It could even be locally on the disk. That's really handy for testing. And that's just not possible for Squirrel or, Win Squirrel or Mac. Like I said, they're drastically different, so there are benefits in, uh, to each one. But um, so yeah, Squirrel or Windows, you give it a URL, it could be a directory with static files, or it could go through a server. But um, yeah, so d the implementation, the, there is a bit differences there, but like I don't want to get into it too much. But uh, there is a few benefits to it. Like say, for example, you can have uh, Delta updates. So they're effectively like, on a Mac, like if you download an update, it downloads a whole new app and replaces it. Same with that Node WebKit builder, or no, no WebKit updater module I said for NWS. Um, but Delta updates are basically like, it will download a binary diff between the current version and the next version, and it'll, pl it'll patch the binary, and then you have the new version. So that's really cool, so it, it says bandwidth. <laughs> but, it, and it'll keep doing it too, like it'll, it'll do it like incrementally. If you're three versions behind, it will grab one patch, it grab another patch, and grab another, another patch. So, but eventually it will, it's not worth it, right? It's just, would if you're 300 versions behind, you should just download a new app. So um, it figures that out itself. So basically it says like, you know, if it's not worth it, I'm gonna grab a whole new app. And I know a lot of this is kind of like complicated, but the great thing is the API is the exact same. It's really, really simple and all this happens under the hood. So like, you just call check for updates. It goes away, it finds out there's an update. And then it says, okay, it's like two versions behind and these are the file sizes or whatever, and then I'm going to grab two of those patches, and then I'm going to do does all that. Then if when it plays all the when it, or sorry when everything is downloaded, it'll call update downloaded event, and then you just subscribe to that, handle it, call restart and install, and it does it. So it's really great. Even though I went through all that, you don't really have to do it in some cases because there are a lot of open source stuff. Like I said, there's a few different mod uh, open source projects for updates. So there are ones that. You can use S3 as your backend, or like use GitHub releases for your updates, and all of them stuff. There's even ones that have like UIs for the admin dashboard. One other thing I should have said actually about Delta updates is that 
you actually have to have those binary diffs, those actual delta updates there, which are other updates. So um, how do you compute those? It's still a great thing about Electron Builder, it just does that for you. So you just need to set a flag. So yeah, so what's it like to build a desktop app versus a web app? First of all, there's browser lock-in, which is a guilty pleasure. You know every single one of your users is using Chromium. And you know which version as well. If Let's say if you only have one version of your app. So as you might have seen in one example earlier, I used ES6. Like 90% of ES6 is, is usable now, I think, in Chrome. So you could use that. You could use anything. You could, like, you could use this, uh, you can even enable like experimental features within the browser. Um, you could, for example, you could use the power of Node and the fact that you have browser lock-in. You could have, you could make a, a multiplayer Russian roulette game that deletes users' files when when they lose or something like that. You know, you can do anything you want. So like, you forget about cross-browser compatibility, i.e., all of and stuff like that. You can use whatever you want. So another one is offline first, but not in the sense you typically hear. It, but you just got to get used to the fact that your app will run offline. So even if someone, la if someone launches your app without a connection or a connection goes in the middle of it, it's st it will still run. It's loading local files. You can load remote URLs, but no one really does it. So like, your files are there within your app. You load it. So when your app starts up, it needs to be able to, like, the experience needs to be good for the user. So you need to like, have really good like, uh, reconnection stuff, different things like that within your app. It's just something to be aware of. Another thing we're working with local files is that like protocol list URLs are kind of annoying. So that's where like you'd see a URL where it doesn't have HTTP or HTTPS at the start, it just slash slash whatever. You might see it typically like with uh, scripts, uh, script tags to load stuff from CDNs. So what that does is like if the current page is on HTTPS, it resolves that URL to HTTPS forward slash forward slash um, or HTTP. But in this case, if that if you use one of those, it'll resolve the file. And then that file won't exist on the file system for a user, so it doesn't, it'll just explode. Oh, it won't explode. But uh, <laughs> the, the, that's fine, because you're not going to do that, right? Like I've told you now, so no one's ever going to do that, right? But it's third party developers you need to worry about, because if you use some other script that goes and downloads some other script or anything like that, then it'll break. So you have to let this, use, this author of a, of a module know, like, I know you made this little JavaScript thing in a, at the weekend, but I'm now using it on a desktop, which you, desktop app, which you probably didn't expect, please fix it, or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's a few different things with file. Um, like say, uh, it's really quick to load, and there's no, um, there's no in, a, in the browser, like there's a, a limit on the maximum number of concurrent requests per domain, that's gone. There's a few other things like that. You'd never load from a CDN or anything because it's so quick. Um, yeah, so another one that's like, kind of annoying is that like there's just so many assets you generate, like with Electron Builder, like I said, every time you make a new release, you generate a dot app, a dot zip, the Delta updates, you'll generate a new Windows installer because if someone goes to your website and installs your app, it needs to download the newest version. There's no point in them downloading the app and then have to download a new update straight away, right? Um, so yeah, that's it's pretty frustrating, but you get over it. You automate everything, use Electron Builder, get used to it. Um, there's a few different unexpected things as well, like unexpected behavior. So like one that might be obvious to you, but like it's a little bit frustrating is all your HTML gets cut off within the boundaries of the browser window, right? So like if you use, let's say you make an app that's a music player and you make a really small window that's like a mini player mode that stays in front of everything else. And let's say you put a drop down on that and then someone taps the drop down, it, it expands without outside the app because it's a native drop down. But if you, the second you use a non-standard, like a non-native JavaScript select library, it'll get cut off, so like this. And that's really, really frustrating. And there's a few other edge cases where you might want to do something like this, and you can't. And the only way around, like if you really wanted to do something like this, would be like to drop the native frame, use a custom frame, actually have a wider window than is there, and it's transparent, and oh, you don't want to do it. Um, so. Yeah, there's a few other weird things like that that are annoying that I ran into anyway. So for exa example, <coughs> you can have custom frames, like I said. So in that case, you just turn off the native frame with a, with a flag, it's friend. Um, but then you need to have HTML and CSS to have custom nice buttons and a little uh, nav bar, or like Chrome. Uh, but then on Mac, I don't know if you're aware that every window on Mac likes, let's say every window on Mac has a header and a body. So if you think of Finder, like you know, there's all the options up there and then there's the body down here. In Chrome, that header is like your address bar 
and stuff like that. And the body is your whole web page. So when you're running your app here, your whole app is actually the body, right? There's no header. And on Mac, typically, when a window isn't focused and you click or hover, the hover styles or the click, well, no, let me just say, the hover styles at least anyway, if you have a blurred window and you hover on something in the header, the hover styles apply, but not in the body. It might be something you're aware of, but it's intentional, and that's just the way how it works. So if on, if in your app you use custom, a custom frame, so you have your own little traffic lights that made by HTML and CSS, if your window isn't focused and you hover, and let's say you want them to change color or something like that, that won't happen because it's within the body of it. And in fact, even if you click, it'll focus the window, and then you have to click again to close it on Mac. That's really frustrating because there's actually a bug in Chromium that if you move your mouse within a certain speed range, which you might happen to do, then it works. But it's a bug because it breaks platform expectations. So like they're going to fix it, but basically what I'm trying to say is that like you could have this thing that's really frustrating your users, that they can't close the app without clicking it twice, and you don't know. You know? So those little things are kind of unexpected, and they're a little annoying. So um, tooling-wise, um, everything's the same, really. Like It's a web app, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You can use any sort of, you can use Babel or whatever if you want to, whatever. Um, and then there's a few extra tools, like I said, to help with desktop app stuff. Um, so yeah. Um, so like, what's it like to maintain a desktop app versus a web app? First of all, there's like the release flow because it's like a whole different mindset. It's really this is one of the, the most annoying things is that it's more like a mobile app. With the web, you like roll out something, you might break something, and then the next day you can just fix it and roll out, and people trickle in and reload and whatever, and it's just fixed, and you forget about it and you go to sleep. But with this, it's like there's old versions out there haunting you that are always broken, and people might not update. And when you roll out a release, you have to really worry. You you're just worry a little bit more, like, is there broken code in this? And so, like, I even further than that, like, you have all these old versions of your app out there, right? So, like, they're all hit using, like, you've got code that exists in different states, so, like, it could be hitting your API, but in slightly different ways for different versions. You could have changed in one version that now it hits th this parameter or this parameter is different or whatever. So your API needs to handle all, needs to be really versioned like well and handle all this stuff and have the test cases for all that. And there's a lot of times then where you're like, we might roll out a feature and we're like, ugh, I wish we didn't do that three months ago. Or I wish we slowly phased that out now or three months ago in time for now or things like that. So it's, it's pretty frustrating, but you get used to it. But it's it's like it's like a mobile app flow anyway. If you happen to have mobile apps within your company anyway, you know. Um, so yeah, there's new problems. I already talked about some unexpected behaviors, but like I don't know if you're aware, but there's a 256 uh, character limit on file paths on Windows. Something you you probably wouldn't know as a web developer, and it's annoying. Like we had a case where we used like this was a while back where we had npm2. So the the file structure when you install your modules was recursive and you eventually get a path that's over 256 characters, ship the app, user opens it on like XP or something, and then it just doesn't work, it doesn't run. So th this leads me on to, like we, we ended up fixing that, like so in that case you have to like, like what, what I'm gonna get at is that like sometimes errors are really fatal because you can break your app from even running. Like you can, if you have auto update logic in your code, it can break before it gets there. So in that case, like for us, we had to like reach out to all our users and say, on Windows and say, our app won't update, you're stuck, you're gonna have to download it again. It's really horrible. So like the way, so then going forward, the way we fixed that, like we made sure that it wouldn't happen again is we just created a little Gulp plugin that uh, when we generate our app files, it simulates as if they're in where they would be on the Windows machine in the app data directory with a long user's username and just checks if it's over 256 and if it does, it fails our build. Um, so yeah, like I said, fatal errors can be really fatal and that's really annoying and because of that and the fact that you've multiple versions out there and all different code and stuff, you really want to track which versions you have and stuff like that. But like Google Analytics doesn't work out of the box, at least at least out of the box on, on desktop anyway, it doesn't like file URLs. Um, if you're tracking like bug reports and stuff like that, like we use Sentry and for a while it was very frustrating because you could fix a bug and then you see it come in and come in and keep coming in because the old versions are still out there and still people are still using them. So you really need to make sure when you're picking one that it has support for like uh, versioning like per release so like you can see that this bug is coming in on that release rather than and not like that you have to click in and actually see check the version it should be like a whole separate like page or something and Sentry does have that to be fair we just didn't know or else they added it after we 
rolled out. Um, so yeah, automated te automated testing. Um, there is some way, like NWS isn't great for this, but there is some ways that you can kind of communicate into your app using this thing called Chrome Remote Interface, but it's not really worth it. Um, Electron is a bit better. The Electron team created a module called Spectron, which is for testing electrons. So not only can you say click this button, check that this is here, whatever, it'll actually you can actually like click like the, the native buttons, which is impossible if you no matter what you do, any hacker you do to, to get like Selenium running your app or something. So they can actually trigger like what if the maximize event is fired, does my app then do this or whatever. Um, you could even like since it's HTML CSS and JavaScript use the static files that you generate for those and actually test those as well. But you will have some problems with that. So like, this is what I want to get onto now is, it's not necessarily desktop or web. You could have both in the one code base. But say like in that case where you have automated tests trying to run your HTML file which loads JavaScript, you've like Node.js requires in there, right? So first of all, you want to like wrap those in like if in browser, do this or whatever. So you need to like, you know, detect if you're on the desktop or not, but that's fine. Um, even then, you might, even the stuff that is, isn't in desktop, isn't to be used in desktop, like say Node and things like that, or Electron uh, APIs, you might have just like split up your app because you could use Node to require stuff and you just might have broken it down nicely. Then you might want to use a mo module bundler that supports CommonJS, which is basically the style of requires that Node has. So, like browser fire webpack or something like that. Um, so sorry, no, like this is gonna get like there's gonna be more and more tools there, but like this is if you really wanted to do it. Um so yeah, module bundlers, but then you'll have even you'll have problems say like if you're using ES6, like you can use an electron, you might need to use something to transpile it like Babel or something, or just don't use it at all. Um so even in both those cases, you're still gonna be sending a lot of redundant code to the web and it's gonna slow down your web app. So um instead of having like at runtime detecting your whether it's in the desktop app or not, which you can do, it's better off to pass it in like during your app build time. So then like your module bundler like Browserify or uh, Webpack or whatever can do a static analysis and tree shaking and basically we'll see like, okay, it's instead of saying if in desktop, it'll know that means if false. So therefore it won't go in there, it won't traverse that require and try and bundle it into your module. Um, so basically you end up with a lot less code in the web. So that's great. But you need to you know, go to a bit of lens to do that. Um, so something that Larkin touched on was like continuous delivery. So like rolling out early often, say like if you've a lot of tests, te theoretically an intern could um, push the master, gets tested and roll out or whatever. That's it's kind of conflict here because of that re release flow again. So if someone changes the line of CSS, you don't want to put out a new desktop release, even though you could automate it. You don't want people downloading that on Mac, they have to download a whole new app again, right? Um, and just other things like that, like you can't take back broken stuff. One great thing about continuous delivery is that like it's small incremental changes that you can roll back quickly. You can't roll them back, so it, there's a conflict there. So what you probably would do in the end is find some kind of happy medium where you roll all, out all the fixes quickly to the web and then maybe once a week you make a desktop app. Like something like you would with a mobile app, right? You're not gonna do that mobile any roll out every time you do something. Even though you know, I do believe in that, and it's definitely the way the web is going. It's a good thing. Another one is while well, our on was that you might want to have features roll out everywhere at once. Um, so you can't really do that because you have to roll out a release. It's this is a niggly thing. You, this is fine. Most time, you, it's fine. Like you might make a press release, and then people just have to download an update. If you really wanted it, or you want to beta test, you would use like a feature flags API or something like that. But that's if you're really, really going deep into it. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much it. So this is my book. If anybody is interested in any of that, there's a 50% off code. Um, so yeah, hopefully you agree with me that as a web developer, you have all the skills you already need. And even for the desktop is where it can be leveraged, your skills can be leveraged the most because you've accessed HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Node, you can really reach beyond with extra APIs than anything you could do in the web. So yeah, thanks. Anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, so I've been using NWJS and Electron for a while, and the one issue I always really come back to is how to 
like effectively serialized data back. So I've got I've got two or three applications that are just for data entry. And originally with NWDS, I would like I'd launch an, uh, an express server in the back with a REST API and I consume it. But more recently, I've been looking towards just like using something like NEDB or even just Mongo in the back end. Is, do you think there's any uh, real advantage to either approach? Do you, do you mean you're running ex Express in your app? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, I've never done that. Um, so like like I said, with Node, you can do anything you want. So you could technically, yeah, do any just like you said. But I've never done it, and I wouldn't know of the advantages. Really, like I, I would guess that that's not something that most people would do. Um, like you could use just since you mentioned storage, or just say like there is, you could use anything like local storage. You could use uh, flags to the browser to increase that. You could use any DB, like you said, or Mongo in the back end, or store to disk and all that. Um, it's kind of that's kind of more of an application problem, I guess, like how you want to design your app. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it really relates to Electron in that. Yeah, you could do the same with the web and just hit a URL and just. So I don't know. I guess it's up to you. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. Anyone else? Hey. Uh, so better developer experience, uh, building web apps or building Electron apps? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Which Electron's APIs and documentation like? are brilliant. You don't have to worry about doing things like you do on the web, but I feel bad about that anyway. <laughs> like, I work on something that is one code base for desktop and the web, so I always have to worry about both. So if I was working on desktop, I love the web, I would still probably not do the whole browser lock in and go overboard because from the same code base you can get so much value. So I guess I probably prefer the web because of continuous delivery and the way that's moving and stuff that you can you can really push out stuff and fix it really quickly and like I like that on the web you can discover apps and stuff you can't really with with um desktop apps. Like I should have said as well, like the Electron for example has Mac App Store compatible builds which are basically normal builds except without the auto update or that allows you to quickly like be able to put it into the app store, whereas with NWS you have to jump through a lot of hoops. But even in that, like people have to go to the app store and download your app. So maybe it's not developer experience, but me personally I prefer if you're asking me native versus web, I guess like but it's all web code in the end and it's good. It, the release flow is awkward but you get used to it. But you have checks in place and test stuff and um I yeah, I wouldn't drop either, but I guess if you put a gun to my head I'd say web. Hi. Um, so I, I guess when you want to um, take the latest updates of Chrome and Node, you have to rebuild. Would that be correct here? Yeah. So the, so every time there's a new Chromium release, there will soon after be a new Electron or NW, NWS release. I know for a fact that NWS released a new update within 24 hours of every major Chromium update th this year. So you just, the next time you're building your app, you, you build with that Electron version in your config for Electron Builder. And most of the time, there's nothing you need in there that, let's say if there is a bug in Chromium, then you could force updates or whatever. But in most cases, you're just going to grab the newer version. Next time you make a release, it's not a big deal. Okay, but it, so that was my second question was, how, how, how fast does it turn? But you're saying it's very, very quickly. Uh, to grab a new update? You know, between when a new version is released yeah. and very Electron starts to consume it. Yeah, very quickly. For a long time, people who worked on Electron and people who were fans of it and stuff said about NWS that they were so slow at keeping up with Chromium because of how they integrated with Chromium. But in fact, they just recently changed like how they're organized and now like, no code changes. And within 24 hours, they have a new update every time there's a Chromium update. Mm -hmm. And Electron, I don't know the numbers, but it's, it's similar or better. So okay. really quickly. And um, is this the same for the node? Yeah, as far as I know. I don't know the numbers on that now, but as far as I know, it's really quick. Like even the reason why, like I said, in, in Node WebKit changed to NWJS, one of the reasons is because they were actually relying on IOJS, the, the fork of Node. So they were really up to date. Like they were on top of that within a few days, like and there was a new update out there with IOJS. They were, they, they were supporting that. Like. Thank you. No problem. So is that the same for your users? Like say you're using some some new fancy ES, ES6 that yeah. came out in the new Chromium, 
do they have to re-download it or is it that part of the auto update process or no like your electron app you can't have an update that's like only updating chromium within your app you just have to make a whole new app that you happen to build with the new electron version which happens to have the new chromium version in it so it's an intentional decision like that okay i'm gonna put i'm gonna put a new release and this time I'm going to bump the version of Electron to the latest one, uh, which happens to have the new Chromium, which happens to have some new feature or whatever. But like I said, you can also enable experimental flags in Chromium to have those features before they're out. So I know someone, for example, who's using like 95% of ES6, and they use Babel just for one, I can't remember what it is, but one little thing that isn't there yet. So soon they'll have a desktop app that's completely ES6. Um, I've I've worried about that, but I've never been able to prove it. So I worried about NWS because I think uh, I'm not sure who it was, whether it was Spotify or someone else or Viber or someone used NWS, and I we noticed some weird memory issue or something weird going on, and we you know you could blame it on that, but we never proved it, you know. So I've never ever seen it. It seems to be a completely isolated dot app or dot exe that has multiple processes depending on at least one main one and then depending on how many view how many render views or tabs or windows you have not tabs just not tabs but um yeah so I, i've never seen it um if you're if you really wear a problem you can't figure out you're going to blame stuff like because you don't understand but yeah i have ne never really seen it i never seen it proven either like i'm very active in like the issues on github and stuff um i think i think anyway could be proven wrong any more? No. Thanks very much. Great talk.